Bruce Lawn. You have this section. Uh, this is on page 96. And you said with the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, you would think by the noise made on social media and news networks that there is overwhelming support among black Americans for defunding or abolishing the police. However, recent, recent research done by the Gallup has shown that 61% say otherwise. That is why it's imperative to give voice to the margin. So you're saying 61% of the black community saying, uh-uh. No, 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 no. We need some policing. We need order. Right, 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 right. We need structure, right? That that policing is, is, isn't is a white supremacist concept. No, no, we need uh, policing. We just maybe need to do it differently, you know? And, and so I, wa I want you to, t to talk about that. Yeah, so let me, so it's, there are things that people will say that are white supremacist structures and, and institutions that I will say, I see how we've, label them white supremacist institutions. Um, now, historically, there's a very good argument to be made that yes, policing is a um, is an institution that was built on the supremacy, not, not solely because it was a political institution that was built to squash political movements, not amongst black folks, but um, amongst people who just didn't, mostly poor, um, that started in England, moved its way to the East Coast. However, today, we see that policing has mostly targeted areas of poverty and because areas of poverty are densely usually densely african-american or are brown then obviously that means those people are who are targeted are black and brown and so here's the issue here's the grand issue i've i live in a community that is highly policed let's just say mm -hmm. uh, i've had my car broken into guns pulled out whatever the thing is, is that we can make an argument that police don't necessarily stop crime. However, policing is necessary for the purposes that we know that violent crimes happen in, in, in particular communities. And in order for us to figure out how to, to squash those violent crimes, you need some sort of agencies. And that doesn't mean necessarily policing, but you need something. And it's ignorant for me to say, well, off top, we need to just do away with policing when we know that if there are areas which 90 percent of the crime is done by people of color, it's going to be hard for these folks to not police those particular areas. Like this was an issue in New York. And I forgot the guy's name who did the research. He's like, look, I let me let, before I move on, let me say that I am highly for police reform, not just police reform in black communities in general. I feel far too many people are murdered by police. I feel far too many people are arrested for ridiculous crimes. I feel like far too many people are in jail altogether. That's a whole nother podcast. I do believe in ridiculous reform. I mean, drastic reform and also for prisons. I almost am, I'm a prison abolitionist. I almost do not believe in prisons altogether. Um, but that's a whole nother conversation. But to to his research, he says. Take New York, for instance, almost 90 percent of 97 percent of violent crimes in New York City are were perpetuated by black and brown people. Mm -hmm. If you really are trying to figure out how not to uh, how to bring down the, the, the rate of crime in New York, the reality is, is you you have to target the people who are perpetuating crime, not only because these are the people who are perpetuated but the people who are who the violent crimes are done against are also black and brown and mm -hmm. so when you go to areas like baltimore where you had a, a freddie gray and then all of a sudden there was an increase in crime but there was also an increase in you know criticism of the police you had officials in this conundrum like what do we do mm -hmm. do we do we respond to police calls or do we just fall back and here's the and this is the issue because the people who are who are the crimes are being perpetuated against still call the police they still want protection mm. and they still but the people who usually um and I, and this is a harsh generalization the people who operate or orbit outside of those particular spaces are the ones who are the loudest voices against policing defunding and etc cetera, etc cetera. and yep. so for me i i live in this conundrum I, mm. I, I, I walk outside of my house, literally, this is no, I walk outside my house, two, Jew, two dudes are trying to break into my car and then they take off and they run. I was about to chase after them. And then I think like, if I chase after them, I don't know what kind of weapon they have. What if they turn around and shoot me? Then I'm thinking, call the police. But I'm like, man, if I call the police, what happens with their interaction? What if the police shoots them? And then Jeez. now we have a protest in my city. 
And so I'm, I'm sitting here like these are, the, these are the issues in which we deal with. And so um, it's to sum it all up, here's the way that I see it. I see it like Jesus interacting with the woman at the well. She, Jesus looks at the system and he says, these Pharisees are punishing this woman, are punishing this woman with with these, uh, the Pharisees are punishing this woman and they have zero right to do this because they get away with the same types of uh, 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 lifestyles that mm -hmm. they're indicting this woman for. And mm -hmm. so Jesus says, there's something wrong with the system. You guys need to fix the system and change the system. And if you think you're better than this woman, then go ahead and stone her. But I see the same sin in you mm -hmm. that I see in this woman. And then he turns into her and he says, look, Go and sin no more. Come so on. when I look at my community, I say, look, man, like, look, there's obviously a policing problem. There's police brutality. There's there's over policing. People are being arrested and stopped for ridiculous things. We need to change the system. However, my brother, like you got to stop robbing folks mm. <laughs> like and I understand the position that you're in and how America has created this position. But guess what? We're we're wiser, smarter individuals than the predicaments that we're placed in. And we can figure out how to escape these predicaments without just saying, oh, well, it's the, it, how can I say this without? Yeah, I would just say we, we can figure out how to escape what some people may call these pathologies by um, applying better wisdom and, and better application to issues that aren't always solely racial issues. Some of these are very economic issues, yep. but the race compounds the issue as well. So, yeah, yeah, that's good. And, hopefully and, that and, was cogent. No, that was good. And I think when we talk systems, I think there's just two things I think of. One, I think of people that are still in prison for selling weed in states where weed is legal. Right? Yeah. Like like doing 20 there's a, there's a gentleman doing 20 <laughs> something years ridiculous. for selling weed in Michigan and Michigan is legal, weed is legal. Like that's outlandish to me. Then there's folks that are still under some degree of the third strikes law where maybe they had the first two crimes and then they, you know, uh, did, did a petty crime, a theft or something like that. And then that escalated and they got their third strike and they're doing 20 years, 16 years, whatever. There's a, there's a gentleman in prison right yeah. now for having three grams of crack. He 16 years for three grams of crack because it was his third offense. So there's over 3,500 people doing life in prison right now for nonviolent crimes which is which is when you talk about prison reform i mean goodness gracious 3500 people doing life in prison for nonviolent crime and then when i think of police reform i think the issue with some of this is just terrible branding abolish police defund defund police like it sounds Page, not page, right? it, it sounds antagonistic. It sounds like we're just trying to get your attention and you know what I mean? And just say something wild. But when you actually look at what that looks like uh, in um, Camden, New Jersey, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the story. They mm -hmm. abolished their local police. Right. The, the, the mm -hmm. sheriff stepped in, rebuilt and rehired everybody, fired, rehired everybody, made everybody go re to, through the training and then would yeah. intentionally drop off these police officers in Camden and be like, all right, go figure it out. <laughs> like, you want to eat? Go figure it out. You want to use the restroom? Go figure it out. And they saw that that alone and retraining these cops completely mitigated a lot of the tensions within the communities right. and decreased Camden, New Jersey as being the number one murder capital per capita mm -hmm. to, to businesses coming back, to all kinds of amazing things. Right. That, and Camden, New Jersey is completely, and in part, it, like, because they do, they do need law enforcement. You do need some degree of law right, order. Right, and obviously right, right. we saw the same thing in, in places like Brooklyn and more law presence, you know, gets more businesses in, appreciates the property taxes, I mean, the property values and all that kind of stuff. So if you own property, it's a good look. If you don't own property, it's not it's not a good look. You're gonna get forced out, right? right? So it, again, I hear you on this and that's like an issue tension. Itself, yeah. Yeah, and you talked about that in the book, uh in, in terms of um people getting getting pushed out, poor people getting pushed out, um, and, and how that's like a uh, you know, it's happening all over right now. Um in New York, I know people who owned property in Brooklyn, in Flatbush, in Bed-Stuy. And, and literally became multi-millionaires 
elect guy who's an electrician, guy that worked for the city bus driver that mm-hmm. just bought property back in the '90s, brownstones, and now those brownstones are worth two million dollars. Black folks, um, and it was and it completely transformed their legacy. They were able to stay and benefit and get tenants, and all you know, all the hipsters moved to Brooklyn, and now they're they got a whole brownstone right. right now. And so I've seen that, and then obviously you also see the cons of gentrification, where now the the, fo- the poor folks can't afford to stay and are getting pushed out further and further. I mean, it's it's happening all over San Diego and Los Angeles right now, where's more and more folks being pu- pushed out to the high desert, more folks being pushed out to the Inland Empire. Um, I hear you on the tension, man. King Stream Entertainment, Bruce Lawn. Hey, thank you so much for making it till the end of this video. If you found it valuable, please consider giving it a like and subscribing. You can check out one of the other videos related to this that'll be over here. Now I gotta tell you about a free training I have for anyone that is an entrepreneur, a creative, an artist, but maybe you are unsure on how to find your voice, how to find your niche. I have a free training in the description of this video. Check it out. Once again, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you and I will see you on the next video.